Hello and welcome to the Community Voice. I'm Farah Sachs. Today is a really exciting show. First of all, we have a live audience with us as well as we want to thank our show sponsor, AJ Madison. It's the industry's foremost appliance authority and the largest online appliance retailer in the country. The experienced staff can assist you in helping you find the perfect appliance for all your needs in the kitchen and beyond. They have three great locations on the East Coast, including one in North Miami Beach. So I want to thank you, AJ Madison, for being part of the community newspaper family. And I'd like to drum roll, please. I want to welcome our guest, our special guest, Susie Fishbein. You need no introduction, girl. Thank you. So sweet. Thank you for having me. And apparently it's not the first time we've met. No. My daughter was 11 years old, dragged me to an event <laughs> in Boca Raton. So we slept, and there you were. You signed graciously. I have all nine of your cookbooks. Um, and Kosher by Design is really taken off in the industry. You're a cook. You're an author. You are really a pioneer for women in this industry that otherwise have not had a place where they can put their recipes and live the experience. And you do that through these pages of these nine volumes. So kudos to you for really uh, bringing the community together. Thank you. 500,000 copies of this Kosher by Design series. So it really, really has resonated with people and has had staying power. It's, it's incredible. It's been an incredible journey. You are a fourth grade teacher. That is science. my training. I, am, I had a master's in science. I was a fourth grade public school teacher. It's a job I loved. I thought I would be doing it forever, but it turns out forever was only three years. <laughs> so what happened? Like, how does one go from being a teacher to really being a teacher in a different world in, as a cook, Well, my as kids point that out when I say like, oh, it's such a shame that I wasn't, didn't stay with teaching. I, I was really good at that. And it always points out that I am still teaching today. What I do through my books, what I do in front of audiences, it's, it's that same teacher voice that I get when I'm teaching. And it's the same imparting of something that you're excited about, that you want to share, that you want people to go home and feel capable you know, to do on their own. But it, um, it really kind of happened because I had an amazing job. I was a tenured teacher on Long Island. And my husband and I were living in the city. And then we moved to New Jersey. And, and you grew up and you grew up in New Jersey. I grew up on Long Island, mm -hmm. so in the town where I was teaching, and um, I was commuting uh, two and a half hours each way. It was like five hours a day in my car, and I just it was killing me. I couldn't do it. So my husband and I found ourselves in suburbia in a big house with no kids, and then I had no job. So I went knocking on my synagogue's door to say like, "Hey, you looking for any volunteers?" Synagogues don't often hear that, <laughs> and it turned out. And you know when they do hear it. <laughs> Sisterhood president within six six months like that. that's exactly what happened and I had a knack for fundraising and by then then I had one child and the local uh, yeshiva Jewish day school came knocking to say um, you know you're, you're a good entertainer good cook you like to entertain and um, you're very good at fundraising would you be interested in co-editing a cookbook with actually one of my girlfriends at the time um, for our school. And you have to dial back in, in time where, where we were. This was now 23, 24 years ago. So there was no internet. There was no food network even. It was just like a couple of strange guys like playing around on a, on a food set. Um, and people like me would wait for my Martha Stewart magazine or a book to come out in the library. It was Martha Stewart and Ina Garten. They were really the only two doing these like gorgeous, modern, fully photographed cookbooks. But as someone kosher, um, I would look through their books to see like, well, what are they doing that I could, for Easter, like that I could do for Passover? Or how can I make this work on my Shabbos table? Um, and so my co-editor and I thought like, yeah, there is a hole. Like if it's a hole in our lives, it'll be a hole in other people's lives as well. So we did some fundraising. We did a book for the school called The Kosher Palette. And it was a huge success. It sold 50,000 copies. So 50,000 copies is a New York Times bestseller. But it was a self-published book. So the book comes out, 50,000 books. It's like going to Kinko's when you order a book. Gets delivered to her garage. I open up the kosher palette office in the, you know, in the floor of my bedroom. My husband used to come in. You know, if you bought a kosher palette, you spoke to me in my bedroom. And I processed your credit card. And then she would wrap it up. And one of our husbands would drop the books at the local post office. That was how that operation worked. And I was selling to Judaica stores and to gift shops and to JCCs all across the country, running that business six days a week out of the floor of my bedroom, nursing my babies while I was doing it. Like, that's just what my life was, six days a week. And um, 
talking to, you know, the bookstore owners, you start to form relationships. And I'm talking to one one day, and he's like, when are you going to write your next book? I'm like, do you know somebody for me to be writing my next book with? And he said, I'm going to get you an interview at Art Scroll. And so, so Art Scroll, to, to back up, they do mostly spiritual, religious they are, publishing. They are a religious book publisher. They, and so they knew nothing about cookbook. They had been looking for 30 years for someone to do a cookbook for them, and they never found the right person. And they... So in walks Susie. Yeah, they took a chance on me. And from the very first day of that first book, it was just a runaway success. And the way that the books came out in such succession was I, I wrote a book. I took one day off. My publisher, Gazalia, would call me. He's now Rabbi Zlatowicz. He's now the head of the company. He was working with his dad. His dad passed away. He's now in that position with his younger son working in his position. So it's kind of fun for me to watch how we've all kind of grown in this world. Um, he would call me. OK, you had your one day off. What's your next topic going to be about? And I, I look at that rainbow of spines, and I see my whole adult life. You know, I, I now thank God I have four kids. Um, you know, when I started this, I did not have my whole family. And I see my life as, as a growing adult, as a mom, as a working mom, as a short on time mom, as someone who was raising kids, raising teenagers. Each, each one of these volumes represents a part of my life. So there are nine. I have four. There are nine. But we have five that made Aliyah to Israel. <laughs> Spreading the wealth with my daughter. The continents. But how long does it take to write a book? It would take me a solid two years working in my kitchen. I, I really tried to keep regular office hours in my kitchen. I would say six to eight hours a day, six days, a week, five days a week, six days a week. And what I find most appealing is that they're easy recipes, that they're beautiful to look at. I, I, one of your books, there was an inscription saying that it has to appeal to the senses. How did you find that you incorporated that into your books? So I was always a very visual person. Um, and I've, you've all heard the, the, you know, the, the line, people eat with their eyes, but they do. So where I could incorporate design, I had an amazing design team led by Renee Arai who helped produce these gorgeous parties, for, but for entertaining in your home. Not for, you know, I have a million dollars, I want to make a, you know, a hotel bar mitzvah, but for it's my anniversary. It's a backyard picnic for my family. How to entertain in your home, which is what I always did choose to do. I never made a birthday party outside of my home. Everything was centered in that home. You know, my husband and I just 30 years now in this house, and our three out of our four parents are now gone. And I, I, I can walk through my dining room, and I still hear the, the, the the, the feeling that was there, the, I can visualize my in-laws, I can visualize my father at my table, at our parties. Our kids grew up there. There is something very special about entertaining in your home that I think some of our generation has sort of lost. But if you kind of break it down and realize like it's not intimidating and there's so much warmth that goes into that in addition to feeding people, um, but just so many memories that can be made that you lose when you go out of your home. And it was interesting, I was in Israel very recently, and one of the uh, restaurants, the t-shirts were, food is an experience. And it really is, because it brings people together. It's the memories, it's the smells. What do you remember? Your, your grandmother's kugel, and, and, or the chicken soup as it was boiling, and the sound that it made, and, and what you remember, and the, and the memories that you make with your family and friends around that table. And I, think you bring, and I think you bring that humanity to your books. I love that I'm part of people's family history now. There are dishes that people make. I have people writing to me on my fan page all the time on Facebook. You know, it's, it's not a, a, a visiting day in camp without your wontons. It's not a, you know, a holiday in my house without your warm chocolate souffles. Like, I think I'm now part of people's, you know, lore of their family histories. So what used to be your Bubby's brisket is now something from a kosher by design book. That's a real honor and an incredible, you know, thing to, uh, you know, a sense of pride for me. Absolutely. And where do you get these recipes from? I mean, there's, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of recipes in nine volumes in this kosher by design. So you can see my evolution as a cook. In the, in the beginning, a lot of the recipes were recipes that I had, you know, grown up with that I have, you know, that were my go-to brunch recipes. I basically did everything but wrap myself in puff pastry. You know, leans very heavily on certain ingredients. I was that wondering you... <laughs> why I gained fifteen pounds eating your cooking. We didn't always know, but now we know better. 
Um, and as I grew and as I, you know, this career gave me incredible experiences. And, and part of my success, I think, has been that I always said yes. Whatever opportunity came my way, even if I felt outclassed or not entitled to it, I just, I always said yes. You want to work at the Disney International Wine and Food Festival at the Epcot Center? I had no business. I'm not a professionally trained chef. Yeah, sure, I'll do that. And then found myself next, standing next to Kat Cora from the Food Network and picking up tips and being like, a very eager learner. I was never the one in the room to want to tell you what I knew. I always wanted to know, what do, what do you know? What can I learn from you? Um, and just saying yes to things like international travel and exposing my palate to other cultures. Um, on the, my days off, I would, I, I would walk wherever I would travel. I would walk through ethnic supermarkets. What are other cultures doing? Because I know we've got duck sauce and puff pastry down. You can see that all over my first two books. What spice palettes come to, from other cultures, and with that opens up a world of food. Um, reading restaurant menus, specifically non-kosher restaurant menus, now kosher restaurants are incredible and are at an amazing high level. That wasn't always the case, even in my lifetime. Walking Manhattan and just reading restaurant menus, um, and just always looking, looking for inspiration, looking for new ideas, reaching out to chefs to say, you know, can I pick your brain? Can you collaborate with me? You know. I loved what you what I ate in your restaurant. Can you teach me how to do that? And you'd be amazed at the generosity of people, how often people will say yes to questions like that. And you'll see recipes with those kind of thank yous to those chefs throughout my books. Amazing. Was your mother a chef or cook? Because I remember, I remember, I'm not, I, I, I skipped my generation into my daughter, but I remember we used to, my older daughter and I, we used to go, cooking with Julia Child, today's <laughs> recipe is. And, and, but that was like a thing that we used to do together. And so did you have a mother influence that helped you, even though it skipped my generation to my daughter? My mother is an amazing woman. She's awesome. She's the most adored person on the face, on the face of this planet. But a cook, she is not. And <laughs> just a week ago, she called me to say, your Aunt Happy, and yes, that is her name, was at the house for Shavuos, and she saw the best of kosher, you know, with the gray spine. I'm never going to cook from it. Do you mind if I give it to her? I just use it for the decor because it matches my new living room. Oh, my gosh. So, and at I least she's honest. <laughs> I did not get it from my father. When the Cooking Coach book came out, um, Art Scroll did a huge publicity event. There were like 300 people, and all of the Jewish press and they had me up on a stage and one of the interviewers comes up and puts the microphone in my father's face and says, Mr. Spector, you must be so proud of your daughter. What is your favorite thing that Susie makes? And he takes the microphone and he says, yeah, I don't really like her food. <laughs> I like my wife's food. <laughs> And he wasn't, I mean, he, it was really the truth. He would sit at my Thanksgiving table, oh my and you can imagine what I would put out at a Thanksgiving meal. I'd be like, nothing. There's nothing to eat here. There's nothing. Oh my. <laughs> so my parents were very simple, very simple eaters. My mom would make Shabbos chicken Thursday night. They'd eat it Friday. They'd eat it Shabbos. They'd eat it Sunday night. They'd eat it Monday. Take a break maybe, you know, one, one or two, you know, weekdays, and then back to Shabbos chicken. So, look, you also have to know who your audience is. That worked for them. His wife was his favorite cook, you know, so. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, so no, I did not inherit it. Um, but my father did like to, like, make things ni look nice on the table, like the way he'd set up his salad. He always did, like, he organized the synagogue dinners for, you know, for his synagogue. So I definitely got that from him, um, of being organized and trying to make things look pretty. You know, recently, not recently, a couple of years ago, you went to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum, and I saw on, a, on your Instagram that you sat with a, and read artifacts, things that they found during that time in World War II, um, and cookbooks and recipes. Isn't that an incredible thing? When you just, just listen to the words that you just said, that they found cookbooks and artifacts of things that survived concentration camps. Yad Vashem has real specialists um, and archives that they don't bring out for everyone, but they do bring out for my culinary tours that women would sit around Ravensburger, one of the, one of the um, concentration camps, and they would pretend, because what, what do people do? What do, what, what do women do when they get together? What are you making for Shabbos? What are you making for the holiday? What are you preparing? And from their memories, they would recite, um, th this, is, this is what my holidays were, and they would pretend that they were entertaining people and make lists of the things that they were going to be serving to their, to their imagination. imaginary guests. And it would 
free them from the hell that they were in for those few minutes. And they have these artifacts, um, particularly of these, this group of, of women. It, it's, it's breathtaking and, and it's mind blowing. And, and for you as an author, here you have, you have, you have your legacy. You have the nine cookbooks and your, how you touch people on your tour, culinary tours. And what was that like for you? I, I could not get out of my, my chair after. I was just shaken. It did speak to me because of what food means in my life and the imagination of what it would feel like. Forget about everything else that was taken from them, but the ability to feed your family, the ability to sit at a table with people you love, to, to not have that in your world when this is my whole world, I don't think it could have touched me deeper to my core. And I wasn't prepared for it. You know, when they said, would you come to Yad Vashem? I kept, you know, to see if it's right for your culinary tour. I kept thinking, oh my God, I, I can't bring a culinary tour to Yad Vashem. What could, they, what could I possibly do here? And I did decline the invitation twice. And then in that mindset of don't say no to anything, keep an open mind. But you said no twice, but it came back I to went, you. I went. And you went. And then I, then I started bringing my tours there because it was just, yeah, just, it, it, it just shocked me to my core. And it was so beautiful and so human. Um, mm. yeah, no words. I, I yeah. get, that, I get yeah. that feeling from you. Definitely. And recently, more recently, you stopped doing cookbooks. Yes. You put that on a pause or a hold, whatever. Mm -hmm. But you're doing culinary tours. You're yes. out in the world. You are in Italy and, yeah. and Israel. And tell I, us what next chapters look like. Because you, you really have like a butterfly, you, you really go from that caterpillar to butterfly phasing. And, and this is just a new, new morph for you. And I love it. And I love it. I love every part of this job. I just feel like the... It somehow doesn't probably feel like a job to you. It, it, it definitely does not feel like a job. It's a lot of responsibility, but it does not feel like a job. Um, I take people to different parts of Italy, and I introduce them to both the Jewish history, the local culinary history, and kosher food in those places. We take a classroom in the Cordon Bleu and make it kosher and tour, do things in Tuscany and Florence all day long, and then in the evening come back, have a three or four hour hands-on cooking class, and then share a dinner, and it's completely kosher, which if you are truly kosher, it's very hard to, to be in Florence for any period of time. There's two kosher restaurants, but um, other than that, like to have a real culinary experience you with the to. local, with because you miss yeah. so much if it's not kosher. Exactly, yeah. and with local chefs and a local cooking school and all of their history. It's amazing. And one of the things that I love about Italy, which is why I keep going back, is Italians are very true to their roots. They're making food in, in their restaurants exactly the way their grandmothers did. There's no mixing and matching of cultures and, and you know, trying to, to morph things and like what we do in America, which we do very well here and, you know, in Italy, it's, they want you to have the traditional food exactly how their grandmothers did. And part of that is they don't whitewash the Jewish history piece of that. Cartufa alla Judea, those famous artichokes that open up to look like a rose, that was a, a relic from the Roman ghetto. And you can go to a non-kosher restaurant, and if cartufa is on the menu, it's cartufa alla Judea. They don't whitewash the fact that that was something that happened because Jews were not allowed to have any kind of jobs or access to good food when they were in the ghetto in Rome. So there's such a, a mesh of history that Italians keep alive and Jewish history that they keep alive for us, which I appreciate and, and honor and love. What gets you excited in the morning? My life, I, I, my, my whole life. I'm a mom of four amazing kids and now two son-in-laws. I'm married to a man who married to anyone else. I could not have this career or this life. Just Cal is the most supportive person. Um, shout out to Cal. Yeah, big shout out to Cal Fishbein. Yeah. You can look up his tuna croquettes in short on time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so now he's a nice chef to our cook also, huh? And, uh, and I love my job, every part of it. That's a joy. I, I don't know that everybody can say that, I think. Or you could probably say that, but to wake up every day and know you're going someplace great, to meet people who love and appreciate what you do and have stories of their own to tell you, you know, reflecting back on what you do, it's just, it's a joy. Susie Fishbein, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, what do you want people to remember about you? Hmm. 
Um, I guess that I lived a life that exceeded my wildest dreams, that in return I, I was kind, I kept my head down, um, was happy for the success of the people that came after me. And I think one of the reasons why I've stopped doing these books is there is a new generation of these young cookbook authors. Uh, in my world, they're, they're all young women, and they're amazing. And I feel like they're now doing it as well, if not better than me, so now I'm going to leave that to them. So I, I hope that I'll be remembered as someone who um, knew when the right time was to come in, knew when the right time to leave was in each part of this journey and career. And, uh, and who knows? I don't know, I don't know what the next 20 will bring me. I would never believe that the first 20 would have brought me sitting here talking about this. Absolutely. And you didn't say no. <laughs> You didn't Did not say, say no. no. So the, the moral of the story is don't say no. Be open to the opportunities yeah. that await. Life yeah. is the adventure. And you never know what, what roads, you know, where, where things are going to take you. I, you know, I could have been finished after one cookbook. I could have been nervous to stand in front of audiences. But instead, and sometimes I feel like I, I need to refund money to the people who hired me to do these cooking classes <laughs> 20 years ago. And I would fumble my way through. And, but that's um, probably part of your charm is that you're real. Sitting with you now, I feel like we're old friends, you know, from New York, you know? <laughs> no, you have that sense that there's a familiarity with you, a relatability. That's a gift that you can't buy. Oh, thank you. And maybe that's been the key to the success of these books. Um, I'm not a chef, and I've never taken a professional cooking class. And I think the reason why these books resonate for people is I am a regular person. I used to be able to say in a regular kitchen, but now that I've collaborated with A.J. Madison, I work in an an amazing kitchen, but still very much a regular person. So AJ Madison, it's just gorgeous. AJ Madison has three locations. One of them is in the North Miami Beach, and you will be speaking there tonight to a sold yes. out. A hundred people are coming out to the showroom, which I say to you know to some people walking around. Uh, you know, Neiman Marcus is like that's what gets them. Me walking into that AJ Madison showroom in Miami yesterday, that was my happy place these gorgeous, shiny appliances, and even things that I, I will never have in my house, I just want to see. But to know what is possible in your home, and they have, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to out her, but the manager of that showroom, Sandra, she's, she has an incredible background in interior design. So you're, you're not just getting someone that's going to sell you appliances, but it's someone who's going to understand a lifestyle, who's going to understand the design piece, who wants you to be as happy in your kitchen as I am in mine. That's amazing. So, so. A, so it's ajmadison.com. Their phone number, if you want to reach out to them, is 305-367-8200. Um, it's been a pleasure. We are going to open it up to the audience because they have awesome. a couple of questions. And they've been sitting there ever so patiently. <laughs> so I, I, on behalf of all of us, thank you for this opportunity. For but we're, not, we're still not done. Okay. So who would like to ask a question first? First of all, I want to thank you for your cookbooks and the fact that food brings family together. And it did that in my family as I was raising my kids making special recipes from your books. So thank you for that. Okay. When you started making your cookbooks, did you have, because really to do what you do, you have to really love food. And I come from a food family, a food background, so I understand that. Did you love food when you started or you learned to love it as you went? I love food. <laughs> Take a look at me. I so that was food. always something you enjoy. You know, when people say, oh, you know, a girlfriend of mine will have me for dinner, and her other friends will say, oh, could you have Susie Fishbein for dinner? You know, what are you going to possibly cook for her? Do I look like I'm picky? I love food. I love when people have, you know, work, work on something, you know, and, and present it. It's, it's a right. piece of them. When someone serves you food on their plates in their kitchen, it's like you're a welcome guest in their home. But... Yeah, my palate has definitely expanded. Um, I was definitely like a, a pasta and a, you know spaghetti and ketchup girl, mm -hmm. you know, way back when. Um, You've so come a long way. <laughs> I, I, I have. I definitely have. And these recipes reflect that for sure. Yes. My second question is: Now that you do all of these cooking tours through Italy, would you ever consider doing an Italian cookbook, an Italian kosher with the history of? I don't the know Jewish that I have the right to background. do that book. Um, two books actually recently came out, um, Cooking a la Judea, and another one that I can't remember the name, but Sylvia, look it up on Amazon, that do exactly 
um, what you're describing, and it's their history, and it's their story to tell. You know, I, I used to get asked, would you ever do a gluten-free book? I'm like, why are you asking? Do you have kids who are gluten-free? And when the person would answer yes, I'd say, it's your book to write. You can't write authentically if you're telling somebody else's story. And I started the interview by saying that rainbow of spines, I couldn't have written Kids in the Kitchen before I had kids in my kitchen. I couldn't have written Short on Time until I was a mom of four kids and I was constantly flying away for work and I found myself short on time. So although I love and appreciate the Jewish piece of, of Italian history and its food, it's not my story to tell, I don't think. Um, and there are people who tell it really well because it's their history, it's their story, both the Jewish story and the Italian story. So look up those books. Thank you. Lisa, do you have a question? Um, so, here's the microphone. A little more. I think you may have. I think you may have addressed them generally. Oh, I can sit down. Um, <laughs> um, first of all, I also love your books and have almost every single one of them. Not the latest two, and uh, they're definitely things that are staples in my house. Even the sesame noodles that come with the chicken, but without the chicken, I we do, do them. that all the time the same way. And um, so, it, and, and I feel like you really put a modern twist on um, Jewish cooking and kosher cooking. I think until your books came out, everybody thought of Jewish cooking as like the old fashioned, unhealthy stuff. And all of a sudden, it was like really good. And a lot of people who would come to my house and be like, oh, it's kosher cooking. And then it would be like, really good normal cooking and it was all your all your I recipes. I sometimes sit in front of audiences and there's not a kosher person in the audience. They just love the fact that there is a kosher cookbook that is modern and elegant and healthful and it's a sense of pride. Uh, I work for Chabad groups all across the country and almost exclusively the people that they bring in to the shows that they hire me for are either learning to be kosher, not yet kosher, or just, you know, they're, they're, they're just, they're loving the food for what the food is. And that, that, that's, you know, that's really amazing to me. Definitely. So a more very specific question is when your cookbooks came out, I think that the only par of options, if you wanted to do something dairy, there was Rich's Whip or <laughs> soy milk. And one was very bad for you, but you did it anyway. Right. And the other one, maybe you liked or didn't like. But now there's so many options. Correct. Do you have any hints or updates to the things that you have had or recommendations of what we should do? So there best? is a vegan butter, Mykonos is the brand, okay. that I've had a lot of success with. I like that a lot, and I've tried to incorporate that into my baking. I've also pulled a lot of the fats out of my cooking. You know, the kosher palette was just re-released um, and Sandra Blank, my co-editor, and I went through the recipes. There was margarine in one of the soup recipes. There were things, you know, that 24, 25 years ago that we didn't realize were so bad for you. There was sugar and salt and things that just didn't need to be there. So it's making those kind of adjustments. And then things like all these vegan, you know, the vegan movement has been incredible for the kosher world um, and the vegetarian movement. So, you know, looking at, you know, walking the aisles of a Whole Foods to see, you know, the, the soy yogurts. They're amazing now. Nothing tastes like Silly Putty anymore. Things really <laughs> taste good. So you should definitely, for a healthful eye, be looking towards, you know, the, the cutting Do edge of the vegan world. you recommend any specific ones besides um, Mykonos? That's the only brand that comes to mind. It's really a matter of finding things that are par of, I don't know brands. I know, like, by turning the... Mm -hmm. um, Soytastic maybe is one of the the, the, the plain uh, soy yogurts that I use in a chambella cake that I teach in Italy. I actually bring it with me to Italy because you certainly can't find par of yogurts <laughs> kosher in Italy. So um, I'm, I, no brands are coming to my mind, but a walk up, you know, a Whole Foods aisle will certainly yield great stuff for you. Thank you. Susie, I want to thank you for being part of our family today and much continued success to you. Thank you. you. And um, AJ Madison, thank you so much for sponsoring this show um, and uh, for all your appliance and needs and for just really having quite a stellar, what did you call it, Neiman Marcus experience? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> They're located in North Miami Beach on 163rd Street, 305-367-8200. That's ajmadison.com. I want to thank our audience. I want to thank Susie Fishbein and... Till next time, I'm Farah Sachs, and this has been the Community Voice. Thank you.